What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the founders of RX Bars, which end up selling to Kellogg for $600 million. I had no idea how big they were when I talked to them. Uh, P90X founder Tony Horton, he talked about how he made money as a street mime, um, and that's how he made food and rent money before he built up to sell hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talked about when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Um, and so check out the interviews on Inspired Insider. There's some very interesting conversations. And today's interview is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, our mission is really to connect you with your best referral partners and customers and we do that through a couple done for you services, um, which is a done for you event for organizations and software companies, a done for you podcast service, which I believe is the number one thing I do for my business and my life, meet my best friends, business partners, and many more, and a done for you lead generation it is not paid. Um, it is actually one on one cold outreach using different social media and email. Um, we do have a greater purpose behind what we do. So if you are interested and you know a veteran entrepreneurs, we have a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. So each of the events we do, we will um, do a scholarship and you can go to rise25.com slash mission and apply. If you are a veteran entrepreneur, if you know a veteran entrepreneur, send them to that link rise25.com slash mission. We did one at traffic conversion which I know you guys were at, uh, Stefan, and uh, we had a veteran entrepreneur. We paid for his flight, hotel, food, uh, ticket to our VIP event, and then a ticket to the conference. So it was a pretty cool deal, and so we like to do that at the different events we do. I won't go into the reason why you can read on the page, but um, it's because of our myself and John's grandfathers were big uh, inspirations to us. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the guest today. Um, and so I was thinking about how to introduce Stefan. Like I, he's a really a brilliant marketer, and I know him uh, as a friend. We've even gone to a Cubs game together. Um, but so this is what I think of when I, I think of how does meeting a mysterious woman – at a late night poker game lead to a new career as a copywriter to selling over $530 million worth of product and an agency that helps other companies pour rocket fuel onto their business that go on to sell hundreds of millions of dollars within several years. Um, Stephen Georgie regularly charges fifty dollars to $100,000 for a single sales letter. He's a sought after copywriter. He runs a group of some of the who's who of direct response companies that include people from Agora, Natural Health Sherpa, and some other nine-figure health companies. Um, you can learn more. Go to redoxconsulting.com or if you're at seven figures or beyond and you want to scale your direct response company, go there. If you want to go to copyandfunnelaccelerator.com slash outline, you get Stefan's exact copywriting process, which we'll dig into a little bit today. And they have an amazing group, which we'll talk about uh, as well, and some of the learnings from it. Um, or you could hear his business lessons and musings, which I always love to hear, uh, stephanpaulgeorgie.com slash blog, and we'll link that up. Stefan, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thank you. It's really great to be here. So was that accurate? I would not read it to you. Usually I read it to people ahead of time. Right. Um, I was like, I just want to have you here for the first time. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was it was very accurate, okay. um, and I, I do appreciate that you kind of mentioned the poker table and meeting a mysterious girl because that really changed my life uh, forever, and so it's a really important part of who I am and, and why I am today. Yeah, and if you want to know the story, you can email him directly. Um, but um, I want to dig in deeper and find out what have you learned uh, from. Laura about copywriting because I know that you guys met and you guys are married and you have a beautiful child 
at this right. point. Maybe in the future we'll say, you know, five beautiful children, who knows, <laughs> or pull an Ed O'Keefe and do seven beautiful yeah. children. But um, what have you learned from Laura about direct response and copywriting? Yeah, I, def- I didn't even really know about direct response and copywriting before I met her. Mm-hmm. And so, on one hand, kind of everything, because she started my journey. <laughs> That's just a good answer to someone you're married with. What have you? <laughs> I owe everything to her, yeah. I do. You know, one of the, the best lessons, and this is a very, almost like a tactical and practical lesson, was early on she kind of told me, though, to, when I am writing something, and especially long-form direct response sales copy, to... Uh, just keep going. Basically, when you get stuck to just finish a draft and don't get caught up in the revisions and the tweaks as you're writing. And that's actually stuck with me as one of the most powerful lessons I ever learned uh, because it's so easy to just stop to start trying to perfect a sentence. And then next thing you know, it's been 30 minutes or an hour, two hours, and you start to feel frustrated. Your energy is is zapped and all of that. Versus if you just go through and write an entire draft, even even today, I mean, there's times I'm writing where in my head I'm like, man, I don't know if this is good or not. Maybe this sucks. Like the Tao, you know, all these sort of voices in your head come. Uh, and rather, but, but by the time I finish a full draft or something, first of all, I feel incredibly accomplished because, you know, now I've got this draft. I wrote something long. It was hard. I did it. And so I have this, this sense of accomplishment. And I generally look back and realize whatever part I was kind of questionable about usually it was actually pretty good. And in the context of the the greater whole, it makes sense. And if I do need to make tweaks or revisions, it's a lot easier to take like a really fatty piece of steak and cut off pieces of fat where they're needed, right? Versus taking that really lean piece of steak and just piling fat back on. Um, You know, one one thing makes sense, one thing sounds gross. And that's kind of how I look at it with the copy writing and then um, reviewing and editing process as well. And we'll talk about your process because you have a real specific process that you've honed in. I think I may butcher it, but it's RFMB. Is that? What is it? <laughs> Close. RRMBC. RMBC. We don't want to mess got, that up. I just, four, four the most important so thing good. is the R, is the research. Right. So I didn't want to mess that one up, but RMBC. Got it. Um, and so what other mentors, um, whether it's books or or distant mentors or personal mentors have, have really um, been a big influence on you in direct response and copywriting? That's a great question. Uh, you know, early on, a couple of guys, there, there's a company called Savion Bros and a guy named Tryon Savion. I know Tryon. They're yeah. in the, the survival space and the prepper space, stuff like that. And they had hired me early on to write copy for them. And they were probably the first client that really invested in me. So, you know, beyond just... I would turn them turn in stuff, and they would say great or not great. Uh, they would give me resources. They would they would actually explicate long form like sales letters and have comments, and then have me review their comments and their thought process. They gave me documents on um, you know different kind of copywriting trainings and things of that nature, and even gave me assignments. And they'd even pay me to to learn. You know, so for example, there's something in, in copywriting called fascinations or curiosity bullets, where you're writing these sort of bullet points that get people to either keep reading your sales copy or to buy a product, especially of a training or a course. So, you know, for example, if a survival thing, it may be, you know, why grilling food during a crisis is the worst mistake you can make if you want to keep your family safe. Right. Right. Or the three places you should never stash your guns when, you know, shit hits the fan and the government comes for you like stuff like that but the point is there are things that are interesting to the market that give them curiosity and that make them want to keep reading um or they want to you know do uh to to buy the product and so for example there's a great document by a a great copywriter named tony flores who was a mentor or sorry was mentored by clay makepeace who's another very famous copywriter uh and so i had this, this document it's like a um all about those fascinations from tony flores and they were the first people to give them give me that document and they actually paid me to go through and it lists 21 different types of those bullets and they basically told me write 10 uh, bullets for each of the 21 types so 210 total uh, and like we'll pay you to do that which is amazing right most clients aren't going to pay you to get better uh, and Tryon and his other partner Yifong uh, mm. did that and so it was really really special for me it's also really cool because Tony Flores is actually now a member of our copy mastermind oh, nice. copy accelerator which is really neat for me because it's this Total Comes full, full circle. circle. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Tryon, he's an amazing guy. I've had a chance to to hang out with him a bunch. Um, who, I want to say here who else, but 
about the fascination in bullets, I was talking to John Carlton the other week and who, you know, learned from Gary Halbert um, and Jay Abraham. And he was talking about this exact thing that he would write for everything 50 to 100 bullets or fascinations because you just, he never knew which one would pop out at someone. Like right. to one person, they would get the product because of this one bullet and the other for like bullet 52 and the other one bullet 72. So he was a huge proponent exactly of what you're talking about um, with the fascination bullets, um, even though that's a lot of bullets. Uh, so who else besides Tryon um, have you learned from personally or from a distance? Yeah, I think so. Tryon and, and his partner Yifong were very important for me. Uh, I would include Laura because early on, you know, she's the one who introduced me to copywriting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a copywriter, you model off a lot of stuff, and so I mean, I could almost and and this is sort of cheating, but almost every good copywriter has come before me uh, because what I did, you know, early on, you study the successful kind of work of those who are where you want to be, right? You model off of those people and you, you look at what they've done. And so John Carlton is a great example where I have a, you know, folder in Google drive with a lot of his greatest hits. And, you know, even today I, 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 we talked about headlines in my copy accelerator group and I went through and read a bunch of his classic headlines. And by the way, they're so good. And I just fell in love with John Carlton all over again. And so I could, I guess list him specifically, but you know, Chris Haddad, I would study his writing early on. Chris Haddad is a great copywriter. Uh, you know, Halbert and and Clay and Makepeace and and all of the great copywriters who came before me, uh, you know, I've definitely studied them as well. Who you know, I mentioned Copy and Funnel Accelerator dot com and and you and Justin Goff work on that together. What are some things that you've learned from Justin and how do you guys complement each other? Yeah, so Justin, that, that's great. And in fact, Justin's somebody who, in a way, serves as a mentor to me now because we have both had a lot of uh, success with with kind of, you know, long form direct response, but he today really focuses on the back end of, of sales funnels. So upsells, conversion, uh, optimization, Mm -hmm. revenue optimization, things like that. And so it's really complimentary in that he has a lot, his approach to upsells and and sales copy and sales funnels is very different from mine, but Mm -hmm. it's, it's frankly better. And so just sitting there and watching him teach that stuff has actually been amazing for me. So for example, and for those who aren't really familiar with the kind of classic direct response sales funnel. You know, you have like the the long form video sales letter or sales letter on the front end, the cart, and there's upsells, right? There's like two upsells, three upsells, four upsells, and they're maybe asking them to buy more of what they just bought at a lower price and maybe offering a um, you know cross sales or similar or related products, whatever it may be. Historically I honestly was always kind of lazy about them. I kind of figured, well, they bought the one product. I think a lot of people are probably, right? I, I think so. That's yeah. why you need I, to join Copy and Funnel Accelerator. They yeah. actually will make you do it of what you know you should be doing probably, right? Yeah, for real though. Yeah. And, and and so, like, for example, Justin on these upsells, he, he's writing these 15, 20-minute long video sales letter scripts for an upsell, which to me is like crazy because my upsells were always like 700 words, 1,000 words. And I get, let's say you get like a 20% take rate. And you're like, hey, that's pretty good, you know. Um, but then Justin's get, getting these forty percent take rates or these fifty percent take rates, and when you look at that, you know, economically at scale, an extra twenty or thirty percent conversion rate on your first upsell is is the difference between, uh, you know, okay, it equates to millions of dollars. And on top of that, it, it makes your average order value so much higher that as someone who's going out and buying traffic, whether you're doing media buying, you're working with affiliates and paying a CPA, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, the ability to have, when you have a higher average order value and your margins are higher, you can then afford to pay more for traffic. And that's a really kind of classic thing, right? Because if you, whoever can afford the most for traffic is going to get the most traffic and is going to get to the highest um, kind of like levels with revenue and things. And so it's been very valuable watching Justin teach that. And now it's something that we're implementing into funnels that we build as well. With your group, what seems to be you know, because you guys have a unique perspective of seeing a lot of different successful businesses. What are some of the um, the low hanging fruit that you see that people should be implementing? They're not they're not doing it, or they aren't doing it right. Yeah, that's a great question, and it is true because we've got people in financial, like with Agora. Uh, you know, Dan Lock is, is having a lot of success in sort of the biz op space, and we've got his best copywriter. Natural Health Sherpa, B Shred guys are killing it with um, you know, health 
related things. So, yeah, I think as far as low hanging fruit goes, like one really obvious one is just testing headlines, like split testing headlines, which people aren't doing enough. Uh, and it's 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 so simple, right? How long does it take you to write five new headlines? Maybe an hour. And yet the lift you get can be tremendous. And this is true of direct response and for e-com too. You know, just for example, I, I think you know um, uh, Tanner Larson, right? Mm-hmm. And Bill Grosscale. So, you know, Tanner's a good friend of mine, probably a friend of yours too, and, and he has a big e-com group of people and they do revenue optimization. And a while ago I reached out and I was like, hey man, I want to write some copy for you for free. And he was like really confused and thought it was like a sales tactic or a gimmick. And I was like, it's not. I'm like, I'm just, you know, I, I'm so successful in direct response. I kind of want to prove that the direct response elements that I use for long form will work for e-com as well. And so, you know, we, one of the first tests we did was for a company called Pug Life Harnesses which is owned by a, a woman hilarious. named Sonia's. Yeah, it's awesome. They're, they're thinking about changing the name because they, they the harness is for all dogs of all sizes, and it's yeah. not just for pugs. But, but pug life know. sounds... I love the name. Yeah, yeah exactly. I do. And, it's and they, a good they pun. Do, it's an eight, yeah, it's an eight-figure business. They have over like 5,000 five-star reviews. Damn. Uh, like, you know, just great, really doing well. And so the first test we did was just headline tests. Uh, and I gave them like three or four different variants, and... Long story short, the one you'll see now, if you go to puglifeharnesses.com, is the one that one of the ones that I gave them and they increased their conversion rate by it was like something like ten percent wow. on the homepage. But if you're looking at like okay, they do a thousand runs in a day, just by that headline now it's an extra hundred sales a day, right? So that's like crazy. And it took me all of like twenty minutes to write these additional headlines, and we see that time and time again. So that's such a, a low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, another one with, with upsells would be. If you're doing text-based upsells for your sales funnel, switching to video, we've just found that video, uh, you know, converts better almost every time. Especially if you have a, you know, a spokesperson, whether it's like a doctor or you're the spokesperson or a guru, whatever it is, doing video uh, mm. for the upsell is just it, it, it's a massive lift. Um, you know, one of our one of the clients in our group, which they're like a nine-figure health company, you know, Shred, and they have another company called Scott Nation, and they're awesome guys. They did that where they switched to a video upsell in one of their funnels and increased their conversions by like 50%. Jeez. And this is a company that's like a nine-figure company. So again, you wow. do the math. It's, it's like just massive. Now, the nine figures aren't all from that funnel, but that's a big funnel of theirs that produces a ton of their revenue. And so, yeah, that's another really huge one as well. Those are probably two really actionable ones that people could test very quickly. Do you find that people do have most of these... I don't know, businesses have a, you, you mentioned video upsell. Do all of them have a video on the main, uh, the main page or no, no not, not all of them. No. A lot of them do. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it still varies. We have clients as well for my agency that we just do text sales letters and you can do, you know, build seven figure offers pretty fast with text sales letters. Uh, so yeah, but, but, Probably more have video than don't. I think video is probably generally going to be better, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not like a hard rule. Any um, thought on the, and this goes good on the VSL piece of having a face or not, or just having the words? Yeah, I think generally mm-hmm. having a face is going to be better, but not for 40 minutes or an hour. You don't want to see somebody talking in their face for that long. Uh, you know, generally what works is you, I mean, if you look at the way Golden Hippo does it with, you know, Gundry MD and those offers, which are everywhere, you'll, you'll see Dr. Gundry, but then it's a ton of like stock footage cut in between. And then Mm -hmm. for some of their offers, it then just goes to like a PowerPoint after five minutes as well. Yeah. So I think a combination is is generally going to be the most effective. So what would you say, you know, you were saying Justin is really honed in on the back end of the sales funnel. Um, what would he say about you? I think he he would love my process, and in fact, he's he's kind of made posts in our, our Facebook group that's part of the the mastermind, kind of reminding people like, hey, you should really use this process because it really works and creates predictably better sales copy. Uh, so I think that's probably of all the things what he's been most impressed with. Um, and then even within that, to break it down, probably our which you got right, the research component. Yeah, uh, the only thing most, I got right. No, but it's kidding. probably the most important part. I yeah, think. that's the RMBC. Um, talk a little bit about that for a second. Um, what does each stand for? Yeah, so research, mechanism, brief, and copy. Mm-hmm. So R with research is really understanding your market, who you're selling to, 
what their pain points are, what their hopes and dreams are, what are the things that they believe have held them back in life, you know, I, I term it in, in kind of as victories and failures. What are their victories? What are their failures? What other products or solutions have they used in the past? And what did they like about those? And what did they not like about those? Um, you know, I, I'll look at even stuff like if there's a old kind of an older solution that people use in the past that they no longer use, what happened there? Is it because that solution wasn't effective or is it because it kind of got buried? Uh, you know, and, and so... Basically asking all those essential questions and having answers to those is really going to help. And then to kind of take that further, as far as finding the answers go, where do you go, right? So I go to forums all the time. I love forums. You can look at Reddit, Facebook groups, Facebook pages, YouTube comments, a lot of other places like that. For me, primarily it's forums. And I will take, I will just copy and paste what I'm seeing in a forum and into my research kind of document. So... What I'm really trying to do is as I, as I go to write sales copy, I'm going to take the words from my market and just speak them back to my market. So first of all, I don't have to be a genius because I can just take what I know the language my, my market already uses and I'm going to instantly get rapport with them. Uh, and then I know it's going to connect because that, that's what they're talking about. Right. And I guess one, one caveat, or not caveat, but addition to that is on the forums, I'm looking for posts or topics that have a lot of views, but ideally also a lot of comments so that there's a lot of engagement as well. <laughs> Because everyone views it, but they find it boring, you know. The you know, But if the people are engaging, yeah. it means they're passionate about it. And there's forums for, like, everything. Keto, real estate, investing, guns, you know, survival, uh, pretty much whatever, you name it, there's a forum for it. So that's, like, one of my biggest tricks that makes life a lot easier. Yeah. And I know um, what you do really well is you, you sort of um, map out this bring up their unconscious and a lot of the underlying stuff, but do it in like this hero's journey type of way. Um, I wonder if you could give an example of something you found in one of the forums that struck you that you wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Oh yeah. Maybe in the health space, because I know you do a lot of research and you could speak to a lot of different markets. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so like doing keto, I recently did a new keto offer and it's a pretty saturated market, and frankly, one I'm not that passionate about at this point. But <laughs> I had to, you know, I was doing this offer, and I wanted to, to bring my A game, of course. And so I started hitting keto forums, and they had a couple things. They had what are called non scale victories, and then they also had, I think it was like falling off the wagon, and stories from people who are falling off the wagon. Mm. But one of the interesting things I found through the forum, one of the most constantly popular topics as far as engagement. And people commenting was was people talking about well first of all they all talked about goodwill all the time because they're losing weight they need to get new clothes all the time mm. so rather than going out and spending a ton of money on you know new designer clothes or things like that you know these people would go to goodwill because you can get stuff for cheap so there's all these threads about people and their fines at goodwill uh, and comments about people taking bags of their clothing to goodwill and donating them and how good that felt. And you see all these people coming and responding with their own personal versions of that story. So mm. that was a really interesting thing that I then incorporated into the copy. Um, you know, because as far as if you're painting life and a, a picture of life, once you've had success, you're talking about how, you know, man, and I just went to Goodwill for the third time in two months and had all my fat clothes because I know I'll never need to worry about, you know, bouncing back and, and wearing those again. And um, so, yeah, you're able to just take that interesting tidbit that seems to connect with the market quite a bit and, and incorporate that. That's amazing. Yeah. And stuff you wouldn't have known unless you're living that, that journey, I guess. It's such an issue for me with like a lot of copywriters not doing the research and then just being like, these people want to lose weight and then they think they know the market, but they don't, right? And they just get lazy and they talk about, you know, you're going to burn pounds, you're going to melt fat, you're going to shed weight, you're going to look in the mirror. It's like, sure, right? But is that what people are talking about? Are they waking up like, man, I want to shred this fat? It's like, no, they're like, man, I want to get rid of this whole section of my closet where all my fat clothes are. I hate the fact that I'm worried in the back of my mind that I'm going to put the weight back on. And so I'm, I'm too emotionally afraid to get rid of this clothing because, you know, it's almost like the safety net for me, but it's keeping me from, from fully realizing my potential. And talking to them about that versus like, you know, just incinerate belly fat. It's like, you know, such a different uh, yeah. kind of conversation you have, but it's generally going to connect on such a deeper level. That's a great point. Um, you, I feel like you're a real down to earth, modest guy, and you are coaching some really top copywriters. And I think even 
having that mentality of even though you really know the market, you like go in as if you're a beginner, like you don't know it. How do you get the people that you coach? Um, how do you put it to them so that they they may think that they know, but maybe they they should do more research? Is there a way that you position that to them so that they, even though they may be an expert, to actually go in and still do the research? Like, how do you get them to, to think like that? I, t- I teach them and go through the research process and give mm-hmm. them examples and show them the treasures that it can yield. So, for example, the Goodwill uh, kind of tidbit, things of that nature. I tell them very explicitly to do it. Uh, I think one thing that, that motivates them is my the process I have, the RMBC process, allows me to write very fast copy. Mm. You know, I don't always want to write copy that fast because it's not like it's it's intense, but I can write a great sales letter in like two or three days and it takes a lot of other copywriters like two or three months. And so I think them understanding that by following my actual process, they can produce more copy and then showing them what's the upside of that. Well, if you're an in-house copywriter and you're doing more projects, you can make more money if you're getting a commission. If you're a freelance copywriter, yeah. you know, now you can do 10, five projects a month instead of one. So you're now, you've just literally just five X your monthly income, right? Just by using a process. And so I think when you explain it and those what's in it for me type terms as well, that's a good motivator for them. Yeah. And people can get that process, right? If they go to the copy and funnel accelerator.com slash outline, that's where they yeah. can get okay, that. Okay. Exactly. So, and just a note on that, cause there's, I have my, my copy outline, which is the C part, but there's also a video from the mastermind talk I did at traffic and conversion, uh, mm. which I do go through the entire RMBC process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've listened to it. It's fantastic. Um, what else in that? I, I want to talk about your journey a little bit, but what else in the RMBC? Obviously, the research is huge. What else should we mention that would be really important in that Just process? To, right. Yeah, to round it out, so the M, which stands for mechanism, is the unique mechanism behind the problem and the solution, which is really important. So you're essentially explaining to them what the unique mechanism behind the problem, you know, why they failed in the past and that it's something unique. It's something that they didn't know before. So it's a surprising reason for their failure, frustration, and pain. And then the, you know, solution is basically the converse of that or the the logical connection, which is like, if this unique, if this is a unique reason why you failed, now you know that here's a unique reason that you can succeed where you failed in the past. Because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to get past that gate of uh, skepticism or disbelief that they have. And because anytime someone comes to a person who's overweight and says, hey, this new diet's going to help you lose weight, their first reaction is, yeah, I've, I've, I've done tried oh, 72 things. So many diets, I lose weight, I come back, I yo yo. And so, you know, your goal is to be like, yeah, of course you did, because you didn't know this one thing. Here's that one missing link. You know, you had 99% of it, but there's this 1% that you just didn't, it never clicked. And it needs to be something good and true that really will click. And once they understand that, okay, they're like, wow, you know, shoot, okay, so maybe that is why, but what do I do? Well, now here, I've created this system or this supplement or this coaching that's going to show you exactly how to implement that 1% or take it and, and put it into your life so that you can get long-term results where you failed in the past. So that mechanism is, is, is extremely important, and it's not just for long form. I mean, you see in air co- uh, e-commerce all the time, Molecule air filters do a great job of it. Have, have you ever seen the ads for Molecule? Mm-hmm. M-O-L-E-K. No. It's like a $900 air filter, um, and they, they're, yeah, it's on e-com. I bought one eventually because I have allergies. Uh, but yeah, I saw their ads, but their, their video, and it's like a two-minute video, is essentially talking about how most HEPA air filters can only capture particles and things like that. So they capture it, but they don't actually destroy kind of a, the, the crap that's in the air. And then you have to change it. And so versus they have this sort of like micro whatever technology that like uh, basically uses infrared technology to like to, to blast the, the bacteria or allergens or whatever in it. So it destroys it instead of capturing it. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's so simple, but you see that and you're like, wow, it's really interesting. It gives they you the reason talk- why other things haven't worked in this exactly. one way. Exactly. Exactly, and it differentiates it so well. And the other thing that they say that I think most HEPA air filters are effective up to 0.03 microns, right? And they're like, well, here's a list of all this shit that's smaller than 0.03 <laughs> microns. You know, do you want that in your air? And you're like, no. Like, well, guess what? Ours, because we're zapping it, it kills everything. Um, and right. so, 
you know, that, that's a good example. copywriter constructed <laughs> that, that video. It did. It's a great video. And I think they're, I don't know, you know, I'm sure they're, they're an eight figure brand and if not on the way to nine figure and it's, it's a, you know, really good. Um, so yeah, mechanism is super important. And then the brief B is essentially just, just listing out what you're going to write. And so for these first three steps, they all apply to almost any copy you're going to do. Uh, I would still do, even if I was going to just be writing Facebook ad copy, I'd still be applying this brief component as well. And so in the brief component, you're answering questions about, again, who's your market? What are their short-term pain points? What are their long-term pain points? What's the solution that you're offering them? Uh, what's the story behind the product? What are the uh, big promises you're going to make about the product? What's like a metaphor? I love selling in metaphors, and I think most copywriters do. What's a metaphor you can use? A few other questions. And so by answering all those those kind of questions, once you go to write your copy, you sort of just really feel like a master of the offer, the product, the story, everything else, and it just makes writing the actual copy that much easier. Mm, love it. Um, I want to kind of go back in time a little bit. So, you know, we talked about the copy and funnel accelerator, which is the present, um, and a little about Redox. Um, I wonder if there's one example, you don't have to name company names if you can't, because I know one of the things you guys do there is you pour rocket fuel on things, essentially, and from your experience, and we'll, we'll back up and go where that comes from, but what's um, a good story from the Redox Consulting and, and what uh, things people did to pour, because every business wants to pour that rocket fuel um, absolutely, on. Absolutely. Yeah, I think generally with clients who maybe, there, there's a lot, I mean, because we, we, it, it really, I mean, ultimately our whole thing is getting, helping you scale with more conversions, better average order value, making more revenue and profits and, and getting larger. And so there are, are cases where people need a complete copy rewrite or they have no copy at all. And so sometimes it's been as simple as creating a sales letter for them that goes on to, you know, gross hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a month for them. And that alone changes everything, changes the game. What were they using previously? Just sometimes like, e-com, e-com pages, Just maybe. an e-com page, I gotcha. Yeah, or, yeah, e-com, or if they had a sales letter, maybe they already had a sales letter, but it just wasn't very good. You know, if e-com is interesting, I, like there's definitely times now where I, I work with e-com companies where I don't really even want to write a sales letter for them. I don't necessarily think they need one, but I think we can just optimize you know, for conversions on that page. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, going back to that like pug life example, but there's actually so much low hanging fruit there that that's something now where rather than trying to push everyone to a sales letter, sometimes yeah. it's like, you know, if they're already doing like pretty decently. It's like, there's just so many tests we can do on that page. And right. so frankly easy for me, but the, it moves the needle so much for the client. So I love that stuff as well. Don't do a full uh, overhaul, but just, okay, get the headline, put some good bullets in there and just, help that page yeah i mean it can even be like visual stuff too right maybe they have like five thousand five star reviews and they're at the very bottom of the page and you're like why are they why are these down here right let's move them up um it can be maybe they were like seen on oprah and again it's at the very bottom of the page and you're like what are you doing <laughs> oprah at the very top um you know there's yeah. such little things that right. you think people would know but they don't um and so you know those are things that, that both myself and redox help folks with um and then you know on top of that well, I guess one other thought too is like some guys have an e-com version of their business and they want to do a direct response for it, which makes sense because right you can have that really nice e-com sort of thing going, but you can still have sales letters that maybe are less public or forward facing. But if you want to run affiliate traffic, drive like email drops to it, uh, then it makes sense to you know potentially bifurcate. But you know, but again, it's not a necessity necessarily, and so that was not a necessity necessarily. But yeah, yeah. Um, that makes sense. Um, so some of the low hanging fruit in the Redox you're finding is just kind of optimizing where they're at. Um, are there any other big mistakes you're seeing even successful companies make that um, everyone should should watch out for? Not monetizing their data would be a huge one that I see constantly. And I'm talking guys and girls who are doing, you know, again, seven, eight figures, sometimes close to nine figures and they're just not doing anything with the, their existing customers. They're not remarketing very much to them, which is super, super, super mind blowing. You know, if you're more of a direct response type company, if I was going to monetize, if I have a list of a hundred thousand customers or a million customers, if I'm direct response, I'm selling them a or I'm sending them affiliate offers all day long. 
you know, once I have a good CPA and that I know convert well, you know, let's say you have a hundred thousand person list and you get a, you know, you send an offer as a hundred dollar CPA and a thousand people, you know, from, that's probably a lot, but say a thousand people buy, right? You just made a hundred grand from a single email drop. So you're like, okay, that's pretty good. Rev. And it's pretty much, it's all profit. Actually, not pretty much, it's literally all profit. Uh, but I know guys with big lists who just haven't monetized it ever because they don't know what to do or they're lazy or they don't realize how valuable it is. Uh, even e too, though, I think, you know, there's an opportunity there for whether it's like, you know, other e offers that you can, you know, promote as an affiliate or, or crafting more internal offers and not overthinking it, having a pretty simple landing page with another SKU on it. People, your customers, once they bought from you once, they just really want to keep buying from you. And I see so many people, if anything, it's like a 20% off your next purchase email. Like, great. Okay, cool. But they're not developing real relationships with their customers via email. And I think that's a huge mistake. One other one that I see all the time, and this is something we didn't mention, but I also own a, a call center that does inbound and outbound. And not calling your card abandons and your partials and things like that is, is pretty mind-blowing to me as well. And we, that's something that my call center does, and people are just shocked by how much money they make because, mm. again, you have all these abandons, like, and, and these guys were, and, and girls were trying to buy from you, and for some reason they stopped. And usually one of a couple of things happened, right? Maybe they kind of had more questions that weren't answered. Maybe they didn't know if they could trust you or not. Maybe their kids came in and they had to get up or the kids started crying and woke up from a nap. But generally, when you call those people in the abandons, which most stuff tracks, like Shopify tracks it, most CRMs are tracking it for you. When you call them and they answer, like you'll convert them 70, 80% of the time because they generally just want, once they realize that you're a real company with real people, yeah. they feel comfortable buying. And so that's something that can just add hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, in, in revenue a month, maybe some people millions of dollars. So I, I think that's a huge mistake that, especially on e-com, honestly, no, but so many people aren't doing it on e-com and it, it blows my mind. What should someone say? You get them, you get Mary on the phone. Like, what should I say that, say to them? It will depend a little bit on what my uh, if it's if it's like an ecom or direct response. But typically, the like, hey, K Mary, you know, this is Stefan from ecom company. Uh, you know, we noticed that you were uh, on our site and you were filling out our the card, and then you you didn't finish uh, your order. We were just curious if you had any additional questions or if there's a technical problem. Uh, you know, if there's anything we could any of these questions we could answer mm-hmm. to help you. Uh, you know, complete your purchase and, and, you know, enjoy this product. Yeah. I'm tempted to get a number now. Like we, we conference someone, right? And then we just call them and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's awesome. So I didn't know that. So what kind of, who are ideal for that, the call center? Who's ideal company to be using the call center? Your call yeah, center company. We definitely have a lot of clients in the Nutra space. Mm-hmm. On top of that, we have done more and more with uh, e-com folks, because for the exact reason I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. So you know, people who are selling products and gadgets, things of that nature, typically somebody who has an average cart value of at least like $70, let's say, because especially on the outbound, if we're, the outbound is, is commission only for us, which is great, because there's nothing up front for you at all, right? You just, we do it, and if we, if we are good, you make money, we make money, and if we suck, no, you know, no skin off your back. Uh, but there needs to be enough cart value there that we can do it on a commission basis and have a yeah. margin. And you can also make money uh, while covering your cogs and everything else. Yeah. So, but those are the two kind of main areas would just be e com and, and Nutra specifically. What's the obstacle they give for not using it? Because it seems like a no brainer. Yeah, I agree. I think sometimes people are afraid of like the boiler Bothering room. Bothering people? Yeah, maybe that. Maybe they're afraid of like the boiler room situation. They haven't met us, and they're worried that like you know we're going to call and scream at their customers, and they're like, "I'm trying to build a brand." But of course, the rebuttal to that is like, "That's not how it, it works." We literally are calling as like a trusted advisor and friend, and just outreaching to ask questions and things of that nature. You know, sometimes if the margins aren't there, the margins aren't there, which is fine. You know, if I'm selling like a ten dollar widget, then us doing outbound is not the right fit. It may still be the right fit for you to hire somebody you know, internal to do yeah. those calls. Uh, those are pretty much like the main ones there, I think. So um, I don't know if you're taking new people or not, but do you want to mention the URL? Yeah, it's just uh, turtlepeakcs.com. Okay. Um, yeah, no, we're always, there. that's a, a great company for me as in, it's like the entrepreneur's dream because I, you know, I started very small. It's grown organically. Uh, I meet with the leadership like, Formally, every two weeks, I go drop in. We, we have my agency on one side of the, this building, and 
the call center on the other side. So I go over there and, and check in daily and, and talk with leadership, but it's a very well-run company. Clients get great results. I don't have to be that involved in it, and it keeps growing and, and you know, servicing clients and, and making people happy. So uh, if only every venture that I started you know, kind of ran that smoothly. Turtle Pit Peak, P-E-A-K-C-S, like yes. C is in cat, S is in Sam.com. Exactly, cool. like CS for customer service. Got it. Um, this all stems, you know, Stephen, from your previous company, essentially. You knew there were all these pieces that needed to be put together because um, right. you ran your own health company. Um, yes. Talk about starting that and, and what you did there. Sure. So in 2013, 14, I was really hitting my stride as a direct response copywriter and uh, you know, created a bunch of health offers for a client over in Romania that they, they scaled to doing you know, over $100 million a year in revenue on, on these informational health like ebooks, basically, right. which was great. And I was, yeah. It was amazing. And, and I was making you know, very good money, uh, really, for the first time in my life. I was making kind of like you know, a lot of money. And all that was awesome, but there was still kind of like a ceiling because as, as not like a partner in the business, as a writer, I sort of realized that I could only go so far. And so I didn't like that, and I realized, okay, I know so much now about selling health products. I know the demo so well, all these sorts of things. You know, why not start a health supplement company? I had heard health supplement companies can be lucrative. Uh, I took supplements. I really was passionate about health supplements, uh, you know, because I think um, people buy a book and it just sits on the shelf and collects dust, right? But with a supplement, you're going to take it every day. It's really easy. You just grab you know, two capsules or a capsule of swallow some water, done. So that was sort of the origin of it. And then I wanted to find something unique and, you know, be different in the market, especially as a copywriter. And so I realized that a lot of the market was conservative Christians who were, you know, in the Bible belt. And so I started a company called Holy Land Health, basically where we took health supplements that had ingredients that could be found in the Bible and marketed them to, to that demographic. Great. Yeah. So, for example, like blood sugar, right? Uh, cinnamon has been shown in countless studies to help kind of regulate blood sugar and, uh, you know, help with a healthy insulin response, things of that nature. And cinnamon's all over the Bible. It's in the anointing oil that is used. It's mentioned just countless times. Myrrh. Myrrh is actually, and frankincense, actually. Both frankincense and myrrh are really uh, good for regulating blood sugar. They're both obviously the gifts of the Magi, but they're also mentioned in other places as well. Like myrrh is... Um, given to like Jesus drinks a glass of like wine with myrrh the night before he's uh, crucified. And then they put myrrh on him after he's like uh, dead before he's been resurrected. Uh, you know, so there's just all these interesting ingredients in the Bible and they, a lot of them have like medicinal sort of value and purpose. So that was sort of fascinating to me hmm. and I realized it would resonate with the market. So I got a, a pastor who was a real pastor who also happened to be a supplement manufacturer. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it was like, he actually started as a supplement manufacturer, and then I realized he was a pastor, and I'm like, dude, like, can I have you be like the spokesperson for this? And you know, he was totally cool with it because uh, not only you know was it something he liked and, and that he did, but he was like, I'm going to sell more supplements too. So kind of a win-win for him. Uh, and yeah, we built like a whole kind of brand around that, like blood sugar, uh, hormonal support, some weight loss, memory. Uh, one that people always think is really funny, but that we did do is like a uh, biblical ED pill. Uh, it was called, but you know, we didn't call it ED though. So we looked at it as like sort of a um, like a, a passion and arousal pill. And I was the reason I, I thought there was a, an article a long time ago about this pastor, I think out in California, and how he talked about bringing God back into the bedroom. And his whole stance on it was that you know, sex is not something that we should be ashamed of. God created us with the you know ability to have sex. We should love and honor our partner. And part of that is through our sexual relationships. And so essentially, let's stop being ashamed about sex. And so he would do these sermons about God and sex and things like that. And I'm like, man, you know, that's really interesting. And I'm sure for a lot of the folks in my market, they all have sex. They're sexual beings. Maybe they feel this repression of this guilt or it's not talked about. Mm. So if I can create a product that is both a his and hers, so it's thing like you guys are taking together. It's not even a selfish thing. It's not about him. It's not about getting mm. just get powerful erections. But it's like how do you – you know, to feel more aroused, to bring God 
you know, back into the bedroom, back into your life, back into your relationship through this product. Hmm. So that's how we position it. And you it. send do- you sell double the amount of supplements. Exactly, as well. right? So everyone else is just always doing the ED pill. I'm like, why that sucks that I have to cut the market in half. Like, what if we just do both? And uh, we did, and then that offer was, was and, and kind of product was was pretty successful for us. That's amazing, by the way, Stefan. Thank you. Um, I remember I was watching like Gary Helbert video. I think it was Gary Helbert video, and he talks about <clears throat> one word that I don't know. It, it was it was he spit out some great copy, like one word that boosted a company five hundred million dollars or something or more, a billion dollars. And it was the shampoo company that that put in um, repeat at the mm. end, or like rinse, lather, repeat. Ah, it's brilliant, right? Because right. it just whatever it did to the product, right? Similar to what you just did. So um, that's genius, um, right there. I love it. Thanks, Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so, <clears throat> what else with Holy Land? What's um, I guess. On the super successful side, what was an offer that was just blew it out of the park? And what was one that you thought would blow out of the park that just for whatever reason stalled or didn't work? So the blood sugar one we did, which was called HL12 for Holy Land 12, blew it out of the park. And that was the first one I wrote and was just an extremely successful offer and awesome and great and you know, and I, I will be being honest to you for viewers, right? The copy I wrote as a, as a direct response copywriter studying from a lot of these direct mail pieces. My copy was was very aggressive out the beginning. I wasn't saying I was going to cure or treat anything, but, you know, it was definitely pretty aggressive, non-compliant sales copy. And over time, we made it increasingly compliant. I don't know if we ever got to what you would truly say is, like, absolutely, you know, compliant in the eyes of, like, the FDA or the FTC. But it got a lot better. And what was cool to see was that actually the conversions weren't really affected that negatively because the messaging and the relationship and the spiritual side were so powerful that I realized I didn't have to make a bunch of mm. really big, aggressive claims. Um, but HO12 was was probably that that first sort of offer and one that everyone knew very well. We did – I did one called uh, Solomon's Secret, which was a memory pill. And so – the hooker idea was basically like what, you know, why Solomon was the wisest man in all of the Bible, and there's basically he talks about these ingredients and 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 some of them like are memory, you know, enhancing nootropic ingredients and things of that nature. So I wrote that one, and you know, kind of like deep in like the desert, like archaeologists have made an incredible find because they actually did they think they may have found like the tomb of of Solomon or his people, and they're like jars of uh, like old. I forget if it was a Bacopa Moneri, which is a memory one, or one of these like really proven memory supplements, and they found it. They found so, a bottle of Holy Land. Yeah, they found it. Yeah, <laughs> it dates these, back. These clay, these clay jars, but they had like these, you know, these these aptic herbs and flowers and stuff, and some of them happened to be really strong memory ones. And I'm like, man, this is amazing. Like everyone knows Solomon. I think the name Solomon's Secret is really cool. Uh, the studies were crazy. There's like double blind, placebo controlled, randomized studies on these ingredients. This is gonna crush it, and it just totally bombed. So. Yeah. Why do you think? I think that in the sales copy, I fell too in love with the studies uh, where, yes, the, the double blind stuff was amazing and great. And the fact that it was like there was a lot of kind of uh, research supporting the claims that were made. But I think that I went too long and hard on just study after study after study when these people were more interested in the spiritual and emotional connection, uh, not necessarily the rational connection to the, the copy of the offer. What do you think works so well with the dia- the diabetes offer? I mean, I think diabetes is a huge market. I it was it had that kind of shocking opening. So the first line is warning: every Christian must watch this urgent video right now, uh, and it kind of like gets your attention. It's it, it doesn't us versus them. It's kind of talking about how because it's, it's true. It's saying like ninety three percent of scientists are atheists, right? And the coin is there's some fact. Wow. There's some fact that says that. It's yeah. from your fear is ago and and maybe it's distorted or maybe i've taken a little bit off context you know i'm not sure but but kind of it said 93 system. somewhere and it said scientists somewhere <laughs> it's, you know like it's on the same page it's just you know put them together uh but so there's a very strong us versus them thing right like mainstream science like kind of like wants to laugh about god they don't want you to think that you know, God can help to heal your body. They don't want you to think that God's wisdom is that Mm. powerful. And so they're quaking in their boots because this discovery 
some people are saying that it's you know proof of God's existence and that God loves us because these you know holy ingredients that are mentioned in the Bible and that were carried across the desert sands by the three wise men themselves could hold the key to like you know healthier blood sugar and a stronger healthier version of yourself and I just think it was very yeah. uh, kind of it was like shocking and controversial but also very curiosity driven to p- where people really wanted to know. And then polarizing, which I think is important a yeah. lot of times too. Yeah, and you co- you incorporated like an us versus them thing, so that they get really um, hooked into the story, essentially. Ex- exactly. I think if you look at you know guys like uh, Vince Del Monte, who I really like, or you know Ty Lopez, I think Vince Del Monte says that money follows attention, which is that if people are paying attention, money tends to follow. And I think if you look at Ty Lopez, who is very polarizing, and so many people you know hate his videos and whatever. Uh, but the point is, I think it's better to, to be polarizing and, and well known uh, than it is to be like completely uh, you know innocuous and and, and also uh, anonymous. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Stefan. And um, so I have two last questions. And first of all, I appreciate your time. Uh, this course. is super valuable, and everyone should check out copyandfunnelaccelerator.com slash outline if they want to get you know, that, that really valuable video that you do and also kind of your copy methods. So, um, we'll link that up and people can check that out. And I know you and Justin run an amazing group. So I'll have you talk about that in a second because, um, there's two different, uh, portions of the group. Um, and so my two last questions are one, I always ask since this inspired insider, um, what's been the lowest point and on one side and what's been a proud moment um on the other side and um i'll have you talk to the low point about the business but i do want to bring one thing up because when i did my research of on you you know i heard the poker story over and over and i and i obviously hung out with you and laura and, and everything um but what i didn't realize is the reason you went back home is because your dad yeah and i wanted to have you speak to what are some of the lessons you learned from your dad absolutely so yeah and and for the context for that basically in 2011 i was in texas at an outdoor school teaching children in the wilderness about survival and water quality and following the texas state curriculum and I found out my dad had a stage four liver cancer. Terrible. And it was very sudden, very unexpected. I had not planned on moving back home. But when I found that out, once the semester at the, that outdoor school ended, I, I went back home to help uh, take care of my dad and be with him and spend time with him. And then he passed away mm. in October yeah. of that same year. So yeah. pretty quickly. So sorry. Yeah. No, it's, it's okay. I mean, you know, it is, it's part of life. And, and I mean, the lessons to answer that one, uh, Probably the people always said my dad was very, um, very ethical. That he had a lot of integrity, and I think that's something I try to to bring into my life as well. My dealings with people, both in business and, and personal life. So I really think I got my sense of, of ethics and integrity mm. from him. You know, just a what funny example. Do? Well, he uh, he was he worked for a, a loudspeaker company called mm. Poke Audio. So he was one of their early employees mm. with that. Uh, that's how we originally. They they were based in Baltimore, Maryland, and then they opened a manufacturing plant in Mexico and a warehouse on the other side of the border in San Diego. So when I was nine, my family moved to San Diego, Hmm. and my dad kind of helped to run the warehouse and the manufacturing uh, facility for them. Hmm. And yeah, and he's he 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 has a great cool story too, which I always think about because he uh, grew up and he was born in Indiana, moved around a little bit. As well, he was a very good swimmer, uh, almost kind of made it to the Olympics as a swimmer. Wow. And then he became like a hippie. He went to John Hopkins you know, back in the day, got kicked out of John Hopkins for being a wild party animal, uh, was an alcoholic who prior to me being born, they basically told him because his liver was already messed up at that point that he'd like die in like a year. Wow. He stopped drinking and you know made it to over past 60, uh, which is inspirational. But, you know, ultimately kind of got his stuff together. And he really didn't get his life together until probably the age of 30, which is kind of funny because then I remember him talking to me maybe a month before he passed away. And he told me that he was like, you're kind of like an unguided missile right now, which was a fair kind of analysis because at that point in my life, I had sort of bounced around from a lot of things and 
didn't really know who I was. And, and part of it, I think, was ADD. Part of it was not embracing that entrepreneurialism that I had inside of me. Mm, yeah. Uh, but I also thought it was funny because I was like, man, I'm like 20, whatever it was at the time, like 24. Like, you were the same way. Um, right. But but I think one of the best lessons going back to that was with the company, because I get these jobs of companies, and I'm not one of the entrepreneurs who always got fired. I would always be in line for promotions very quickly, hmm. like way faster than they normally did. And people would think I was like, you know, brilliant and all this great stuff. And I would quit anyway. I'd be like, no, nah, I can't do it. Um, but I remember talking to him when I was in one of these companies and it was like, man, I just, it's so hard for me to know that it's going to be like a year before I can get my first promotion and it will be like years until I get to like higher up. And he kind of said, you know, in my experience, the cream always rises to the top, which I think is actually very, I still think that's a very valuable lesson. It wasn't right in the context of me staying in that company, I don't think, because my, my path, I'm very happy with the path I've taken. But I think about it even as far as like with copywriting goes and if I'm talking to young copywriters and they start worrying about making more money, getting more clients and all those sorts of things. And, and the truth of the matter is if you just focus on being the absolute best you can be at perfecting your craft, at being really good at a couple of things, at just being committed to excellence, if you do all those things and you just focus on that and what you can control, generally you're going to get to that place where everything else follows, where from a copy perspective, you can get paid more money from clients, that you're not having to chase clients, that you have financial stability in your life, all of those sorts of things. So the way I've interpreted that lesson is that really focus on being the cream, right? Instead of worrying about what's up at the top, just focus on being becoming the cream. Uh, so that's probably, that's a lesson he, he t kind of taught me that has really stuck with me. What perspective does that, did that give you, like going back and, and seeing your dad um, cause that must've been obviously really difficult. I mean, I, I find it difficult. It wasn't my dad, you know? Right. Uh, so what perspectives does that give you now? I mean, you're a father now. Yeah, it builds. Well, I think for one thing, it does build a very strong internal sense of strength going through it because the easier thing to do would have been to not go back or visit once a week or not be there. And I, you know, I moved back home, lived in like the guest room, was there all the time, saw you know, kind of terrible, disturbing stuff, like with like, you know, as his body broke down, like his body broke down. And so yeah. just seeing these things, like coming in the morning, you know, on like a medical cot in my parents' bedroom and seeing my dad and he's dead. And I'm just sitting there looking at my dead it's father. Terrible. Right. It's terrible and it's crazy. And it like, uh, it, it changes you. And I think for some people, but I think there's also the lesson of like, you still get to choose how you respond, right? Like Stephen Covey talks about responsibility, which is your ability to respond. Mm. And I think it's the same thing for me. So while I, I mourned my father, and of course it was a difficult time, uh, and, and it kind of goes back to your question about like a low point and a high point in a way. I mean, it was a low point in seeing my father pass away, but it did imbue upon me and inside of me this incredible internal kind of almost confidence and sense of strength of knowing that this was such a difficult thing that I have just gone through. And yet... You know, I got through it. I'm proud of the man I was. I'm proud of how I acted. You know, maybe a few days before my dad had died, we had a conversation where I basically was like, and I was crying. I broke down crying during the conversation, but it was like, you know, hey, man, like, I, I, I'm so thankful for everything you've done for me. I love you so much. Like, you know, you've been such a great part of my life. And I was able to, all, all those things that people sometimes wish they didn't get to say, right. like I got to say, and I was very conscious of it. And I remember my dad being like, this is a really weird conversation to be having, uh, you know, but I appreciate it and I love you too. And the fact that we were able to have that conversation and then he, you know, died a few days after that, uh, is something I'm just so grateful for as well. So yeah, it just, it just changes you. And I think it, 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 it and also you don't sweat the small stuff and a lot of that, like the little bullshit and drama in life, like becomes so much less inconsequential or so much more inco inconsequential and less important to you after you've been through something like that. Yeah, Totally. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Absolutely. Really powerful. Um, <clears throat> on the business side, what's been the lowest and what's been the highest? Or proud I, you know, moment, not the highest necessarily. I think the thing I'm most proud of is really just all of the people that I've employed. So it's not like a single moment, hmm. but when you think about it, I mean, I wrote a post today for, and one thing I'll, I'll, I'll plug real quick is we have a Facebook group too, which is Justin and Stefan Talk Copy. But I write about a lot of stuff besides copy in there, and I post every other day. Justin posts the other days. Uh, and so I wrote a post just about today. And, and thinking about between, I mean, just four years ago, as I was starting the health supplement company, and, and you know, from there, in that time period, I've probably employed uh, 75, 80 different people. Like, I actively employ over 50 people right now. Uh, one of the girls who I hired originally as a customer service agent in-house, who now does all of our affiliate stuff, 
she just told me today I didn't even realize this. She's like, you know, when you hired me for that first job, she's like, me and my husband had, I was pregnant. I had $300 in the bank account. We were actually homeless. We were wow. staying at a friend's house. She's like, I had, you know, my, my mother-in-law gave me one pair of shoes that I could wear for, you know, if, um, like the interview process, like, but yeah, you know, basically you just like, never just know really, what's happening in people's lives. At the you time. never know. And now four years later, she runs our, you know, affiliate network makes six figures a year and her and her three children just moved into like a house in like one of the nicest areas in all of Las Vegas and stuff. And it's like, that's really, really cool to me. It's amazing. Uh, and even in the customer service with our agents and, and when I see them that they, they bought a new car or they moved to a new place or a better area or they bought their kids something cool. Um, that's really what I'm honestly most proud of, of everything I've done is all the people whose mm. lives I've been able to change through capitalism and, uh, you know, kind of just business. And so I love that stuff. It's not like I'm, I don't sit around talking about capitalism and the, the hardcore, uh, kind of laissez faire way a lot, but at the same time, capitalism is truly what's enabled me to do that. And so I love that. So that would be the high point. Yeah. I know I've met, <clears throat> I mean, I got to hang out with Blake. Yeah. Right. Who's amazing. I Absolutely. met him through you, and we've <clears throat> hung out a bunch, had dinner a bunch. Just an amazing human being, you know. And so you get to to do work with with these type of people. Yeah, Blake's another one too. He he also hired him at the same time as Malai, who's the affiliate uh, director, marketing director, and he was at Capital One. He top kind of topped out where he could go there. The virtual office where I was using at the time was turned out to be across the street from Capital One. So he was like literally in the conference room with me we're talking and he's looking at his old work mm. kind of debating if he's gonna make this leap or not and then same thing it's like now he's he's got such an incredible skill set a great network uh has accomplished so many incredible things and so yeah i just i love that stuff yeah love it so, you want to go to the low point low point sure i like to end on the high point so we don't depress well, me well, or I'll... everyone but we'll end <laughs> on the low point and then you'll I'm just, you know i'm still gonna end up being positive about it I, no i know yeah because I don't even, I mean, I just think there's a ton of low points. Like, there's, you know, the first year for Holy Land Health, we lost like $200,000, and I thought I was going to fold it down, and I sat around daydreaming and fantasizing about if I should quit that company and go get a job as an internal copywriter for somebody, and I thought that's what was going to probably happen, and I was full of self-doubt all the time and, you know, worry and anxiety, things of that nature, and so that alone, that whole year was like a struggle. And then what I think is funny is what, you know, then I have all the success after that, but it's kind of like what seems so impossible then now talking back on it, it all seems so inevitable. Like, Oh, of course I was going to be successful. Of course I was going to build these great businesses. Of course I'd be here talking today, but it's like, no, there's in a, a, so many different paths that things could have gone down and I could have just quit at any given time. Why didn't and you at that point? I kept thinking to myself, I don't really want to, well, first of all, I don't want to work for somebody else. Second of all, I really did believe in what I was doing, that it, it was a good kind of um, place in the market to be. And I did think about other experiences in my life where how I had been like close to quitting and kept going. And then just like a month later, that breakthrough would come. And so, and I do think people stick with things for too long sometimes. I do think there's a, a it's a double edged sword. It's tough, totally. It is. But in my mind, I just really believed that we were going to figure it out. And I, I just I just felt like I had to, to until like I literally had didn't have a dollar left, I basically was going to just keep going for it. Hmm. Um, and I did. Yeah, what you did there was amazing, actually. You say it, like I've listened in other videos of you, and you talk about it, not in a, in a non, sort of in a, in a matter-of-fact, nonchalant way. Like, yeah, we you know, did a million dollars our first year and then we did $20 million or whatever. And, and that's not normal. Like I say, right. in a, and then a positive way, you know what I mean? Um, so, <clears throat> but thanks for sharing because it does start off. It's, it's not always rainbows to the whole Absolutely process. Um, thank you, Stefan. Let's point, <clears throat> I want you to talk for a second, copy and funnel accelerator.com. Um, <clears throat> there's two different portions of this. Um, so why don't we end on that? Um, there is a, a platinum and a gold, and I don't think the platinum is even available, but you talk about it anyways. And then, you know, this is super valuable. So, Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So copy, accelerator, and I have to 
funnily enough, the domain is copy and funnel accelerator.com. And then obviously the forward slash outline, it'll ask for your name and email address. And then you'll get the, uh, my copy outline and the mastermind talk where I go through the RMBC method. Being completely honest, we aren't doing anything with those email addresses. I'm not prom- I'm not saying we may not email you in the future with like a uh, stuff, but it's not gonna be like spammy. Uh, it, it's I know it's really funny, right? Marketers who are supposed to talk the talk or walk the walk and aren't, but um, it's just we haven't really needed to, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, the, the the group has already got like uh, 60 plus members in it. Uh, I realized the other day that the members combined the companies in our mastermind do over a billion dollars in sales annually, which is incredible. Uh, and it's a really awesome thing that I love. And so what it is, is, is copy accelerator accelerator is, um, it's a couple pieces to it. There's a weekly training. So it's like a zoom call where either Justin or myself teaches something. So maybe something from the RMBC method or this most recent Tuesday, we did fascinations and we went through and look at examples of copy from different niches and verticals. Uh, you know, maybe upsells, Justin did several sessions on upsells or headlines, whatever. So there's a teaching portion of the call, which is open to everybody. And then the second portion of the call is a live feedback portion, which is open to the platinum group. So it's platinum and gold. So platinum gets the second half of the call and they bring whatever they're working on to the call. We critique it. We give them feedback, suggestions, things of that nature. Really, uh, it's very valuable for them, you know, and and they love it. But what I've found, which is funny, is because I kind of was like, oh, is the gold going to be valuable enough for people? And the answer is like, yeah, the gold is crazy valuable. Uh, and a couple of reasons why one is sure it's us teaching and training and dissecting and we answer questions, but we also have a Facebook group, which is crazy engaged, which I sort of thought of it honestly as like almost like a throwaway, like after sure we'll have a Facebook group, right? right? Uh, people are bringing copy constantly and asking for feedback and Justin and I give it same, almost always the same day except for on the weekend. But even better than that, you've got all these like eight, nine figure business owners in there. And so there'll be total like threads that come where, Somebody's asking a question about, hey, how have you handled this in your business? And then, you know, the CEO of like a forty million dollar supplement company comes in and says, I did this. And then the CEO of a hundred million dollar supplement yeah. company comes in and says, I did this. Yeah. And it's crazy. And it's very unfiltered. Um, very, you know, people are very raw and authentic in there. And so that group is incredible. So we, and, and everyone gets access to that, the gold and the platinum. So for that alone, the fact that gold is also less money, but like I frankly just join gold for now. Um the platinum group is full and we kind of capped it around 20 people because we didn't want to get to a point where we had too many people need feedback and the calls were going for hours. Uh, but we may open to a few more people, but honestly, I wouldn't even wait for that. I would join gold. If you, so who who does it? Who's it for, right? It's aspiring copywriters. It's current established copywriters and it's business owners who want to enroll their in-house copywriters. In a lot of cases, the business owners end up joining as well because of the Facebook group, and they want to see what's working, and they want to know and be abreast of everything. So those are the members. And then on top of that, we do also have a live event twice a year. So our first one is in Austin, September 9th through 11th, Awesome. where Justin and I, it's like a two and a half day event. We're teaching uh, in-person copy training concepts. We're bringing in outside experts, whether it's like you know network compliance or media buying, or it's uh, Google ad copy. YouTube ad copy, whatever it is, we're bringing outside experts and we're doing one-on-one feedback and training for everybody. So if you're in the gold group, bring a sales letter to it. We're gonna have sessions where basically I'll sit down with you, we'll go through your copy together, spend a half an hour on it, an hour, whatever it is. And you know, for context for that, again, I charge like 50 grand a sales letter. I charge uh, at least $10,000 a month for consulting and that's just like four one hour phone calls. Uh, so to get that kind of time with me and Justin, Justin just got paid 40 grand for a single day from Agora to come consult from other divisions. So it's like to get that one-on-one time with us is, is really valuable. Totally. Uh, so that's the program in a nutshell. Um, the feedback's been incredible too, by the way. Pretty much so many people have already gotten their ROI from it. Um, people are, you know, like that the video upsells, right? Just switching to that and increasing your conversions by 50% on upsell one is is amazing. And um, and I'm really giving. I'm really teaching everything I can and, and tons of resources, swipe files, shooting videos, everything. So yeah, if you're interested in copy or you employ copywriters, I would highly encourage you to check it out or just message or, or reach out to me directly about it. Yeah, and if you're not interested in copy, you should be. In my opinion, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the foundation, I think, of at least in my business life and a lot of people's are a combination between direct response and 80-20, the principles yes. of 80-20. And to me, relationships is that 80 20 the relationships is that 80 percent that will as ed o'keefe would say time collapse things and 
you know, something that may take lots of time, energy, um, that you maybe you won't discover, maybe you will after three years and you'll, you'll end up, you know, an opportunity cost, lose hundreds of thousands of dollars or more. Um, that one advice from one person like you or someone in the group is absolutely invaluable, um, absolutely. every single time. So uh, your guys incorporate both of those things, direct response and kind of the 80, what I consider the 80, 20 is relationships. So. Um, go to copy and funnel accelerator.com slash outline. Check it out. Stefan. Amazing. A great excuse to chat with you. So thank you. Yeah, Jeremy, I really, really appreciate you having me on. And, um, I definitely value our relationship speaking of the 80, 20 kind of principle. And, you know, I, I want to get more Italian ice in Chicago Amen. You know, as soon as we can. It's on me. Bring it. Awesome. Man. <laughs> but I, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you. What I got, you get back. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand